the subject that I want to talk about is software in, uh, in regulatory compliance. And I've been with Oracle, I'm in my 20th year with Oracle, and I specialize in business process analysis and design. Part and parcel with that is looking at difficult business problems and trying to understand how software can be used as an enabler to make things better in various domains. And so I think the question that a lot of people uh, come up with is, how on earth did you come to love nuclear? Especially being from Alberta, which is an oil province, right? And it was pretty simple. Uh, Globe and Mail ran a huge spread one time about peak oil. And uh, you see, you know, the impact of that is uh, pretty clearly measured in the food supply. Uh, 10 calories per calorie of food supplied. And uh, if you take a look at uh, a lecture given by Dr. Al Bartlett, who's a physicist from University of Colorado, uh, he explains using arithmetic that on the day we actually hit peak oil, the next 10 years means we will use more oil in the next 10 years than we have used in the history of petroleum. And furthermore, you have exactly 10 years until it's all gone. So to me, that just like, that's panic grade urgency. But in order to calm myself down, I think about uh, Dr. Hans Rosling. He's a medical doctor as well as a uh, econometrician, I believe he calls himself. He's produced many excellent lectures on what a small energy budget and the equivalent income that's required to prevent uh, high infant mortality. And that lower infant mortality means that the population stabilizes in those populations with low infant mortality. And he has actually uh, forecast that world population will pretty much inevitably peak out at about a shave under 11 billion people. And at that point, if we can hit that target with energy, uh, we've got a really good, sustainable, you know, peace dividend type environment. So, uh, you know, I kept digging into uh, energy sources and, and thorium, it was a pretty quick decision to come to. I've seen, you know, probably every minute of footage that uh, Gordon McDowell has done with Kirk Sorensen. And I, I began digging into uh, how NRC is such a big stakeholder for uh, you know, making nuclear happen. And uh, it didn't take long to find these numbers where about 88% of their budget is cost recovery. And then on the opposite side of the coin, um, it takes 10 years potentially to approve a new reactor design. So I looked at this from a business process analyst standpoint and I thought, what, what's going on here? And, and could this be made better? Just a quick show of hands, how many people have spent some quality time looking through the NRC document library and at the regulations and the 10 CFR? That's better than I expected. That's awesome. That's really good. I think that was, uh, that was very good for me to look through those regulations because what it taught me is there's nothing really crazy in those regulations. Um, I'm looking at the, at the process and the activities related to the regulatory uh, activity. And uh, to me, from a process standpoint, I'm always looking to reduce process latency. So that means communication between the applicant and the regulator. How well does that communication flow given the thousands of documents and concepts and ideas that have to move between the two? And then once the information is traded hands, uh, how long does it take for each of those two parties to evaluate and reach a conclusion on an application or changes to a design? And so I wanted to also make sure that as I think about this, I want to make sure that goal congruency is considered because I don't think there needs to be uh, uh, any antagonism towards the regulatory structure because it's all very practical. It's about nuclear safety and nobody, uh, nobody would want that ever to go away. Um, another interesting thing that I discovered is, uh, you know, I had the brainwave about using the regulatory system as a framework to both guide design and communication and I'll get deeper into that. There's already a little company out there called Bentley Systems, and uh, they've got a four-page uh, case study on Callaway Nuclear Plant that I highly recommend, and they've also got a 15-page uh, solution design uh, white paper that I also recommend on regulatory compliance. And so I'll, I'll revisit that in a moment. So why am I here at TIAC? Well, NRC is a client, and I support a large account management team across all levels of government, across all of North America. And this, to me, at, being at TIAC is an opportunity to get field input to some of these ideas and really hear back from people who are going to be entering the application process, or some of you already have, 
to sort of get real field stories about what's hard or what's easy or what, what expectations are about information uh, handling for the regulatory process. So the more I read about the inside the documents of NRC, I really came to the realization the, the entire uh, regulatory framework really hinges on the design of the applications. So from the physical design of the plant emerges the processes to maintain and operate the plant. Obviously people are required to do the maintenance and the operations, so what training and what uh, drills do the people uh, benefit from to make sure that they have the optimum safety culture built in. And overall, uh, NRC looks retroactive, uh, retroactively as well at reactor management. Record keeping is of vital importance to just always have that quality assurance program going on to make sure that that safety is, is never going backwards. So there's, a, there's an information flow that I, I kind of wanted to share with everyone here. And uh, if we start that design, the engineered design, and all the layers of drawings inside CAD programs that get built up, the information that describes that system consists of many layers of data, like the site and the, the concrete foundations and the building and then all the assemblies that go in and, of course, naturally the reactor core. That information then flows into a construction management process where the thing that we've designed, all the components and parts and everything, that gets actually built. And each of those component parts, they have their own maintenance and operation requirements. So the record keeping that describes the as-built plant then feeds into work management maintenance, plant operations. And then supporting all of this, there are back office activities. Everything from procurement, materials handling, supply chain, uh, records management, and of course the people side, the HR. So in order to smooth the regulatory workload, um, Tying that information together with an enabler such as a regulatory framework overlay is of vital importance when we consider the interaction between what you're normally going to do to design and build a plant, which is all of this, and how NRC looks at it to, to actually uh, certify new designs or to uh, give a good scorecard to existing operations. So that's where I want to get a little deeper here. So by the numbers, by my count, I may be out uh, you know, here and there, but looking through the NRC's uh, library, what I find are 31 document collections. The 10 CFR itself appears to have about 55 active parts. And uh, what NRC does with that 10 CFR is then they have defined seven pillars of nuclear safety. And they put this into effect using 216 inspection manual chapters, which I call the sort of the back office and administrative. These are the forms and the documents and requirements that they need in the back office to make their regulatory uh, framework into effect. But where the gold mine is from a activity management and a work management standpoint are these things called inspection procedures because these are detailed procedures that tell an NRC person exactly what to do to go out in the field, look at a design, look at a step in construction, and see and certify whether or not this thing complies with the seven pillars of nuclear safety. Now we get into the hairier stuff. So there's 489 regulatory guides in 10 subdivisions, as well as uh, 26 technical guidance documents that I could find hundreds of new rigs, and then if you look at any particular inspection procedure in some of the other documents, there are literally thousands of standard setting body documents that support the core regulatory framework. And you can see, I'm not even gonna recite this alphabet down here, you guys are familiar with a lot of that. So this is a huge block of knowledge management. So these are the seven pillars, and it's, again, it's all about safety. And me, as a process analyst, I'm looking at what is the activity-based model. And let me just toss one out here right now. Uh, residual, uh, residual decay heat removal system test. So I haven't heard any of you reactor people today or yesterday talk about a reactor that doesn't have one of these. So, you know, considering that you have one, you can give yourself a check mark because it's one particular requirement that you've already met the reg for. Outstanding. So what I'm looking at further is understanding, well, what is all of the collateral information that would go around to a successful pass on that particular test? And what I'm finding is that 
even though you can look inside of the Atom system, which is the agency-wide document management system run by N N N uh, NRC, it doesn't really tie that information together into a framework that I would call a knowledge library framework that could then be actioned upon either by an applicant or even by NRC themselves. And I am aware that there is the diamond system, but I, uh, the only information I could find on the diamond system in, NR, in NRC that is publicly available is it's more specifically guided towards a certain part of independent verification rather than work management between the applicant and the NRC as a whole. So we're still missing that collaborative framework and that knowledge library. So this is what I'm getting at. Ideally, if we can tie together the 10 CFR part, which gives the legislative or the legal authority to the regulatory process, tie together the administrative functions in the inspection manual chapters, and then codify the inspection procedures very precisely, even to include all of the collateral information, such as the regulatory guides and the documents from the other standard setting bodies that, that are mentioned specifically inside the various regulatory parts. What we then have is something that can act as a knowledge library that can be published out to applicants so that you set a very clear set of targets. If you want to come in and do an application, here's your 617 checkboxes. It's a big number, but considering from a work management standpoint, if you know what that number is, you can then divide it up amongst the engineers and administrative people and make sure that everybody knows what their part is. And then you dig a little deeper and you understand which regs you have to address and which standard setting body documents you're trying to comply with as well. So in terms of motivating people and moving people and focusing people, it's very important to have a framework in place. I want to point out another thing too from the work execution standpoint. Um, so if we, if we can set up a basic structure use this to identify and communicate targets, link all the knowledge-based stuff that's, that are the related documents. When we get down into a, a project, uh, to go beyond a project plan and get into work management, this allows NRC to actually dig deeper and, and physically plan and say, how do I interact with the applicants? When, is it when are they hitting a milestone? What teams am I gonna need to go out and enact a, a certain inspection procedure? So it allows them to not only make budget claims to uh, you know, understand what their staffing requirements are, but it allows a more efficient use of those staff, which is a very important thing in a constrained environment to make maximum use of limited people. Um, another beauty, which I think every applicant would appreciate, if we can take that initial structure, prune and graft it to represent the particular application being actioned, now you have a framework in, upon which you can do cost estimates for what will the application process take, take place. But there's one more component that I, wanna, that, that I wanna mention here in that there are other professional services models out there like uh, auditing. So everybody's heard of Sarbanes-Oxley. That's the big, uh, you know, giant corporation set of audit laws. And, you know, imagine an army of accountants descending on a particular uh, company and going to audit it, right? There's two different uh, scenarios which would be cost uh, affected. And one is the company shows up with gigantic cardboard boxes stacked with paper. And the other scenario is where the company shows up and they've got every type of document clipped together, noted, indexed, filed, and ready to deliver a particular requirement under Sarbanes-Oxley. Those, those two diametrically opposed visions mean that NRC would not be asked a difficult question if they fully understood the, the document management capability of the applicant. One more point about this is that given that MSRs don't actually uh, meet some of the stated text inside of the regulatory framework, in order to communicate all of the differences in, in the two reactor designs, I believe a proper framework would enable rulemaking discussion because you can provide to NRC an alternative or a, a, what I would call a, a safety engineered equivalent design that meets the intent of that reaction and then allows NRC to workflow that inside their own organization into the committees and meetings that they need to evaluate. So just a concrete example, um, nobody is gonna build a reactor without doing the ge uh, geotechnical, right? So belt and suspenders, believe it or not, this is 
right out of the paragraphs of Inspection Procedure 45052, tied right back into the Inspection Manual chapter in the 10 CFR appendix. You know, consider all of these steps. You're going to do that as, a, as a, uh, an applicant anyway. You're going to do all of these steps. But imagine from a document management standpoint, a simple step as, as taking a scanned image of the tester's trade union card to, that proves he's capable of doing this test and then having that automatically indexed into uh, your own record system. I'm not the per first person to think about this. Bentley Systems, they are already providing software overlay that sits on top of CAD, operations, materials handling, procurement, HR, indexed by 10 CFR part. The only flaw in that is that it doesn't go deep enough. It should go down to the IP standard and also that should be a standard and a framework published not by a company like Bentley Systems, but it should be published by NRC. So if I could leave you with one takeaway, as you go out into your, you know, facing your applicant processes, think about what NRC needs and consider uh, document management as an integral part of your design process and save yourself a lot of money. Thank you.